Hello, my rhetorical rock stars. Uh, welcome back. Thanks for showing up. Um, I am looking forward to reading some more with you guys, and um, we're going to read um, parts two, chapter one, parts two and three today. Um, I have a better idea now of how much I'm going to be able to read at a time, um, and I did post an announcement on Canvas that um, kind of lays out our reading schedule. I do want to say that, you know, this being kind of unprecedented times, that our reading schedule is pretty slow, especially for a, an AP class and probably for a lot of you. Um, but I, I think that's just kind of what we're going to have to deal with for now. So, you know, we can take the book slowly. Um, hopefully you're finding other things to fill your time, maybe other books. Maybe you're reading ahead in this book and you're using this as a review. But, um, you know, um, we'll just deal with it and we'll have some really hopefully good deep discussions and deep dive into the book and you'll really know it really well by the end. So, um, yeah. Um, also, quick announcement. I do have plans to try to make some review materials for you guys for the AP test. And also, with regards to the AP test, I did see on the College Board site yesterday, and this may be different, I haven't checked today, but um, so things could continue or will continue evolving, I think. Um, but they did say that they're making plans for the AP test to be taken at home. Uh, I don't know what that's going to look like. I don't know how they're going to monitor that. Um, but I think it's good news for you. And we'll just keep our eyes peeled um, for how all that comes to be. Um, right now, of course, the plan is that we would be back at school before the AP test, and we'd actually be finishing up the book on, on the first day that we come back. Um, I don't know how realistic that is. Um, we might be. Um, you know, that, like I said, that is the plan now, but we'll, we'll just see how it goes. So we'll get started reading here uh, in just a second, but let's just take a second to be happy for, uh, for a minute not talk business. Um, what's making me happy today? Um, I am happy. I was, I was, I, I can't tell you how kind of nice it was to hear from you guys on the, on the discussion board the other day, just to kind of hear what you guys are up to and answer, answer some questions. Um, and to just know that you guys are all out there and, and participating. So, you know, that, that's making me happy, you know, being able to go outside and still, and, uh, it's nice outside, take the dog for rocks, walks. I, been out for a few runs um, and you know the weather's been really nice so hopefully you guys are finding things to to uh, stay happy uh, but also to stay healthy and stay safe please uh, and stay sane I hope that some of these lessons and activities will help do their part to keep you sane and keep you smart because you're smart and I miss seeing your smiling faces so Let's uh, let's move forward. Um, so today we're, like I said, we're reading chapter one, parts two and three. Um, we uh, have three questions for analysis. So um, how are we noticing the use of language in this novel? I think last time I mentioned, you know, visual language can be an element of that. Um, and what connections do you see between those observations and previous ideas in the class? You know, we've looked at political cartoons before. We've talked about propaganda. We did some readings about that. So hopefully you're making some of those connections um, as we move forward. Uh, in what ways can you connect ideas in this novel, including but not limited to the use of language to our lives today? Um, you know, what, what, what are you seeing, you know, today especially um, between this novel and you know, other um, things that are happening, that have been happening over the last you know, for your whole life, but also with with this whole virus thing too. What what do you what are we going to start seeing? And then finally, how might fiction be accomplishing something through its unique use of language that other forms of language that we have studied this year can't? So like, you know, the, this form of storytelling can can get ideas across in a different way. And so, how is storytelling doing that? You know, I my mind goes especially to how. George Orwell's able to kind of jump between time frames. I think we we jumped between three different time frames in the last one, which is not something that's easily accomplishable in like a you know a speech or um, an essay or um, you know things like that. So just keep your keep your eyes out for that as we read. 
So I will read today um, again. Apologies for the quality of my reading. I'm doing my best. If you choose not to listen, hopefully you're at least uh, reading along. Um, and every once in a while I may stop and make some kind of comment um, or not. I don't know. It just seems whatever crosses my mind at the moment. So here we go. Chapter one, part two. As he put his hand to the doorknob, Winston saw that he had left the diary open on the table. Down with Big Brother was written all over it, in letters almost big enough to, to be legible across the room. It was an inconceivably stupid thing to have done. But, he realized even in his panic, he had not wanted to smudge the creamy paper by shutting the book while the ink was wet. He drew in his breath and opened the door. Instantly, a warm wave of relief flowed through him. A colorless, crushed-looking woman with wispy hair and a lined face was standing outside. Oh, comrade, she began in a dreary, whining sort of voice. I thought I had heard you come in. Do you think you could come across and have a look at our kitchen sink? It's got blocked up, and it was Mrs. Parsons, the wife of a neighbor on the same floor. Mrs. was a word somewhat discountenanced by the party. You were supposed to call everyone comrade, but... With some women, one used, used it instinctively. There we go, use of language, guys, there we go. She was a woman of about 30, but looking much older. One had the impression that there was a dust in the creases of her face. Winston followed her down the passage. These amateur repair jobs were an almost daily irritation. Victory mansions were old flats built in 1930 or thereabouts and were falling to pieces. The plaster flaked constantly from ceilings and walls. The pipes burst in every hard frost. The roof leaked whenever there was snow. The heating system was usually running at half steam when it was not closed down altogether from the motives of, of, the, of economy. Repairs, except what you would, could do for yourself, had to be sanctioned by remote committees, which were liable to hold up even the mending of a window pane for two years. Of course, it's only because Tom isn't home, said Mrs. Parsons vaguely. The Parsons' flat was bigger than Winston's and dingy in a different way. Everything had a battered, trampled-on look, as though the place had just been visited by some large, violent animal. Games impedimenta, hockey sticks, boxing gloves, a burst football, a pair of sweaty shorts turned inside out lay all over the floor, and on the table there was a litter of dirty dishes and dog-eared exercise books. On the walls were scarlet banners of the Youth League and the Spies and a full-size poster of Big Brother. There was the usual boiled cabbage smell, common to the whole building, but it was shot through by a sharper reek of sweat, which one knew this at the first sniff, though it was hard to say how, was the sweat of some person not present at the moment. In another room, someone with a comb and a piece of toilet paper was trying to keep tune with the military music which was still issuing from the telescreen. It's the children, said Mrs. Parsons, casting a half-apprehensive glance at the door. They haven't been out today. And of course, she had a habit of breaking off her sentences in the middle. The kitchen sink was full nearly to the brim with filthy greenish water, which smelt worse than ever, uh, worse than ever of cabbage. Winston knelt down and examined the angle joint of the pipe. He hated using his hands, and he hated bending down, which was always liable to start him coughing. Mrs. Parsons looked on helplessly. Of course, if Tom was home, he'd put it right in a moment, she said. He loves anything like that. He's ever so good with his hands, Tom is. Parsons was Winston's fellow employee at the Ministry of Truth. He was a fattish but active man of paralyzing stupidity, a mass of imbecile enthusiasms, one of those completely unquestioning, devoted drudges on whom, more even than on the thought police, the stability of the party depended. At 35, he had just been unwillingly evictive, evicted from the Youth League, and before graduating into the Youth League, he had managed to stay on in the spies for a year beyond the statutory age. At the ministry, he was employed in some subordinate post for which intelligence was not required, but on the other hand, he was a leading figure on the sports committee and all other committees engaged in organizing community hikes, spontaneous demonstrations, saving campaigns, and voluntary activities generally. He would inform you with quiet pride between whiffs of his pipe 
that he had put in an appearance at the community center for every evening for the past four years. An overpowering smell of sweat, a sort of unconscious testimony to the strenuousness of his life, followed him about wherever he went and even remained behind him after he was gone. Have you got a spanner? said Winston, fiddling with the nut on the angle joint. A spanner? said Mrs. Par Parsons, immediately becoming invertebrate. I don't know. I'm sure. Perhaps the children. There was a trampling of boots and another blast on the comb as the children charged into the living room. Mrs. Parsons brought the spanner. Winston let out the uh, let out water uh, and, and disgustedly removed the clot of human hair that had blocked up the pipe. He cleaned his fingers as best he could in the cold water from the tap and went back into the other room. Up with your hands, yelled a savage voice. A handsome, tough-looking boy of nine had popped up from behind the table and was menacing him with a toy automatic pistol, while his small sister, about two years younger, made the same gesture with a fragment of wood. Both of them were dressed in the blue shorts, gray shirts, and red neckerchiefs, with, uh, which were the uniform of the spies. Winston raised his gloves above his head, but with an uneasy feeling, so vicious was the boy's demeanor that it was not altogether a game. "'You're a traitor!' yelled the boy. "'You're a thought criminal. You're a Eurasian spy. I'll shoot you. I'll vaporize you. I'll send you to the salt mines!' Suddenly, they were both leaping around him, shouting, traitor and thought criminal, the little girl imitating her brother in every moment. It was somehow slightly frightening, like the gambling of tiger cubs, which will soon grow up into man-eaters. There was a sort of calculating ferocity in the boy's eye, a quite evident desire to hit or kick Winston, and a consciousness of being very nearly big enough to do so. It was a good job, uh, it was a not a real, sorry, it was a good job it was not a real pistol he was holding, Winston thought. Mrs. Parsons' eyes flitted nervously from Winston to the children and back again. In the, be in the better light of the living room, he noticed with interest that there was, there, there actually was dust in the, in the creases of her face. They do get so noisy, she said. They're disappointed because they couldn't go see the hanging, that's what it is. I'm too busy to take them, and Tom won't be back from work in time. Why can't we go see the hanging? roared the boy in his huge voice. Want to see the hanging? Want to see the hanging? chanted the girl, still capering around. Some Eurasian prisoners guilty of war crimes were to be hanged in the park that evening, Winston remembered. This happened about once a month, and was a popular spectacle. Children always clamored to be taken to see it. He took his leave of Mrs. Parsons and made for the door, but he had not gone six steps down the passage when something hit the back of his neck, an agonizingly painful blow. It was as though a red-hot wire had been jabbed into him. He spun around just in time to see Mrs. Parsons dragging her son back into the doorway while the boy pocketed a catapult. Goldstein! yelled, bellowed the boy as the, as the door closed behind him. But what most struck Winston was the look of helpless, helpless fright on the woman's grayest face. It's uh, something to note, I think, that the adults seem to be uh, scared of the children. <clears throat> Back in the flat, he stepped quickly past the telescreen and sat down on the table again, still rubbing his neck. The music from the telescreen had stopped. Instead, a clipped military voice was reading out, with a sort of brutal relish, a description of the armaments of the new floating fortress, which had been just been anchored between Iceland and the Faroe Islands. With those children, he thought, that wretched woman must lead a life of terror. Another year, two years, and they would be watching her night and day for symptoms of unorthodoxy. Nearly all children nowadays were horrible. What was worst of all, was that by means of such organizations as the spies, they were systematically turned into ungovernable little savages, and yet this produced in them no tendency what, whatever to rebel against the discipline of the party. Hey guys, sorry, there was some kind of hiccup, and so I get to read a whole bunch uh, that I've already read back because my computer stopped working. Um, but I'll pick up right where I left off. Uh, and just since I, since I was forcibly stopped, I'll... Um, just uh, use this as an opportunity to say what I was going to say at the end of this chapter, which is to just notice how um, people are afraid of each other 
Hopefully I'll remember to point out a couple of other things that I pointed out while I thought I was recording. So here we go. On the contrary, they adored the party and everything connected to, with it. The songs, the processions, the banners, the hiking, the drilling with dr dummy rifles, the yelling of slogans, the worship of Big Brother. It was all a sort of glorious game to them. All their ferocity was turned outwards against the enemies of the state, against foreigners, traitors, saboteurs, thought criminals. It was almost normal for people over 30 to be frightened of their own children, and with good reason, for hardly a week passed in which the Times did not carry a paragraph describing how some eavesdropping little sneak, child hero was the phrase generally used. There you go, there's some language use for you had overheard some compromising remark and denounced his parents to the thought police. The sting of the catapult bullet had worn off. He picked up his pen half-heartedly, wondering whether he could find something more to write in the diary. Suddenly, he began thinking of O'Brien. Remember, O'Brien's the guy that he made eye contact with. Years ago. How long was it? Seven years, it must be. He had dreamed that he was walking through a pitch-dark room, and someone sitting to one side of him had said as he passed, we shall meet in a place where there is no darkness. It was said very quietly, almost casually, a statement, not a command. He had walked on without pausing. What was curious was that at the time, in the dream, the words had not made much impression on him. It was only later, and by degrees, that they had seemed to take on significance. He would not now remember, he could not now remember, whether it was before or after having the dream, that he had seen O'Brien for the first time, nor... Could he remember what he had first identified the uh, when he had first identified the voice as O'Brien's? But at any rate, the identification existed. It was O'Brien who had spoken to him out of the dark. Winston had never been able to feel sure. Even after this morning's flash of, of the eyes, it was still impossible to be sure whether O'Brien was a friend or an enemy. Nor did it even seem to matter greatly. There was a link of understanding between them. Uh, more important than affection or partisanship. We shall meet in a, t in a place where there is no darkness, he had said. Winston did not know what it meant, only that in some way or another it would come true. The voice from the telescreen paused. A trumpet call, clear and beautiful, floated into the stagnant air. The voice continued raspingly, Attention! Your attention, please! A news flash has this moment arrived from the Malabar front. Our forces in South India have won a glorious victory. I am authorized to say that the action we are now reporting may well bring the war within measurable distance of its end. Of its end. Here is the news flash. Bad news coming, thought Winston. And sure enough, following on a, glory, a gory description of the annihilation of a Eurasian army with, a, with stupendous figures of uh, killed prisoners, came the announcement that, as from next week, the chocolate ration would be reduced from 30 grams to 20. Winston belched again. The gin was wearing off, leaving a deflated feeling. The telescreen, perhaps to celebrate the victory, perhaps to drown the memory of the lost chocolate, crashed into Oceania tis, Oceania tis for thee. You were supposed to stand to, to attention. However, in his present position, he was invisible. Oceania, tis to thee, gave way to lighter music. Winston walked over to the window, keeping his back to the telescreen. The day was c still cold and clear. Somewhere far away, a rocket bomb exploded with a dull, reverberating roar. About twenty or thirty of them a week were falling on London at present. Down in the street, the wind flapped the torn poster to and fro, and the word Ingsoc fitfully s appeared and vanished. Ingsoc, the sacred pr principles of Ingsoc. New speak, double speak, and double think, and mutability of the past. Think of this too. Uh, new speak is a you know obviously referring to language, so uh, keep that in mind. He felt as though he were wandering in the forests of the sea bottom, lost in a monstrous world where he himself was the monster. He was alone. The past was dead. The future was unimaginable. What certainty had he that a single human creature now living was on his side? And what way of knowing that the dominion of the party would not endure forever? Like an answer, the three slogans on the white face of the Ministry of Truth came back to him. War is peace. Freedom is slavery. Ignorance is strength. And you guys also just pay attention to how 
you know, those contradictory statements, you know, in terms of language keep coming up over and over and over again. Um, maybe you can make some connections there. <clears throat> he took a 25 cent piece out of his pocket. There too, in tiny clear lettering, the same slogans were inscribed and on the other face of the coin, the head of Big Brother. Even from the coin, the eyes pursued you. On coins, on stamps, on the covers of books, on banners, on posters, and on the wrappings of a cigarette packet. Everywhere. Always the eyes watching you and the voice enveloping you, asleep or awake, working or eating, indoors or out of doors, in the bed or uh, in the bath or in bed. No escape. Nothing was your own except for the few cubic centimeters inside your skull. The sun had shifted round and the myriad windows of the Ministry of Truth, with the light no longer shining on them, looked grim as the loopholes of a fortress. His heart quailed before the enor enormous pyramidal shape. It was too strong. It could not be stormed. A thousand rocket bombs would not batter it down. He wondered again for whom he was writing the diary. For the future, for the past, for an age that might be imaginary. In front of him there lay not death but annihilation. The diary would be reduced to ashes and himself to vapor. Only the thought police would read what he had written before they wiped it out of existence and out of memory. How could you make an appeal, make appeal to the future when not a trace of you, not even an anonymous word scribbled on a piece of paper, could physically survive? The telescreen struck 14. He must leave in 10 minutes. He had to be back at work by 1430. Curiously, the chiming of the hour seemed to have put new heart into him. He was a lonely ghost uttering a truth that nobody could ever hear. But so long as he uttered it, in some obscure way the continuity was not broken. It was not by making yourself heard, but by staying sane that you carried on the human heritage. He went back to the table, dipped his pen, and wrote, The future, uh, to the future, or to the past, to a time when thought is free, when men are different from one another and do not live alone. To a time when truth exists and what is done cannot be undone. From the age of uniformity, from the age of solitude, from the age of big brother, from the age of doublethink. Greetings. He was already dead, he reflected. It seemed to him that it was only now, when he had begun to be able to formulate his thoughts, that he had taken the decisive step. The consequences of every act are included in the act itself. He wrote, Thought crime does not entail death. Thought crime is death. Now that he had recognized himself as a dead man, it became important to stay alive as long as possible. Two fingers of his right hand were ink-stained. It was exactly the kind of detail that might betray you. Some nosing zealot in the ministry, a woman, probably some, someone like the little sandy-haired woman or the dark-haired girl from the fiction department, might start wondering why he had been writing during the lunch interval, why he had used an old-fashioned pen, what he had been writing, and then drop a hint in the appropriate quarter. He went to the bathroom and carefully scrubbed the ink away with the gritty dark brown soap which rasped your skin like sandpaper and was therefore well adapted for this purpose. He put the diary away in the drawer. It was white. It was Sorry, it was quite useless to think of hiding it, but he could at least make sure whether or not its existence had been discovered. A hair lay across, laid across the page ends was too obvious. With the tip of his finger, he picked up an identifiable grain of whitish dust and deposited it on the corner of the cover, where it was bound to be shaken off if the book was, was moved. So before I go to part three, I think I've pointed out a few things about language, but also let's just keep in mind how oppressive it feels to, you know, he, he feels that everybody is possibly his enemy, right? And there's this kind of looming dread of people watching him. And um, so that's something that you may connect um, to life, especially now during this virus thing. It kind of feels that way, doesn't it? Part three. Winston was dreaming of his mother. He must, he thought, have been 10 or 11 years old when his mother had disappeared. She was a tall, statuesque, rather silent woman with slow movements and magnificent fair hair. His father, he remembered more vaguely as dark and thin, dressed always in neat, dark clothes. Winston remembered especially the very 
thin soles of his father's shoes and wearing spectacles. The two of them must evidently have been swallowed up in one of the first great purges of the fifties. At that moment his mother was sitting in some place deep down beneath him with his young sister in her arms. He did not remember his sister at all, except as a tiny, feeble baby, always silent, with large, watchful eyes. Both of them were looking up at him. They were down in sub some subterranean place, the bottom of a well, for instance, or a very deep grave, but it was a place which, already far below him, was itself moving downwards. They were in the saloon of a, of a sinking ship, looking up at him through the darkening water. There, were still, there was still air in the saloon. They could still see him and he them, but all the while they were sinking down, down into the green waters, which in another moment must hide them from sight forever. He was out in the light and air while they were sinking sucked down to death, and they were down there because he was up, the, up here. He knew it, and they knew it, and he could see the knowledge in their faces. There was no reproach either in their faces or in their hearts, only the knowledge that they must die in order that he might remain alive, and that this was part of the unavoidable order of things. He could not remember what had happened, but he knew in his dream that in some way the lives of his mother and his sister had been sacrificed to his own. It was one of those dreams which, while retaining the characteristic dream scenery, are a continuation of one's intellectual life, and in which one becomes aware of facts and ideas which still seem new and valuable after one is awake. The thing that now suddenly struck Winston was that his mother's death nearly thirty years ago had been tragic and sorrowful in a way that was no longer possible. Tragedy, he perceived, belonged to, it, to the ancient time, to a time when there, was, there were still privacy, love, and friendship, and when the members of a family stood by one another without needing to know the reason. His mother's memory tore at his heart because she had died loving him when he was too young and selfish to love her in return, and because somehow he did not remember how he, she had sacrificed herself to a conception of loyalty that was private and unalterable. Such things he saw could not happen today. Today there were fear, hatred, and pain, but no dignity of emotion or deep, complex sorrows. All this he seemed to see in the large eyes of his mother and his sister, looking up at him through the green water, hundreds of fathoms down and still sinking. Suddenly, he was standing on, sh on short, springy turf, on a summer evening, when the slanting rays of the sun gilded the ground. The landscape that he was looking at recurred so often in his dreams that he was never fully certain whether or not he had seen it in the real world. In his waking thoughts he called it the Golden Country. It was an old rabbit-bitten pasture, with a foot track wandering across it and a mole, a mole hole here and there. In the ragged hedge on the opposite side of the field the boughs of the elm trees were swaying very faintly in the breeze, their leaves just stirring in dense masses like women's hair. Somewhere near at hand, though out of sight, there was a clear, slow-moving stream where, uh, where dace were swimming in the pools under the willow trees. The girl with dark hair was coming toward him across the field. With what seemed a single movement, she tore off her clothes and flung them disdainfully aside. Her body was white and smooth, but it aroused no desire in him. Indeed, he barely looked at it. What overwhelmed him in that instant was admiration for the gesture with which she had thrown her clothes aside. With its grace and carelessness, it seemed to annihilate a whole culture, a whole system of thought, as though Big Brother and the party and the thought police could all be swept into nothingness by a single splendid movement of the arm. That, too, was a gesture belonging to the ancient time. Winston woke up with the word Shakespeare on his lips. And... I guess it's obvious for me to point out that Shakespeare is considered one of the, you know, the, the great, the masters of the English language, if, if not the master of the English language, right? So, you know, constantly these references here to language usage and, you know, the way that language has changed and is evolving and is affecting Winston. 
The telescreen was giving forth an ear-splitting whistle, which continued on the same note for 30 seconds. It was not 7.15, getting up time for office workers. Winston wrenched his body out of bed, naked, for a member of the outer party received only 3,000 clothing coupons annually, and a suit of pajama was six, pajamas was 600, and seized a dingy singlet and a pair of shorts that were lying across a chair. The physical jerks would begin in three minutes. The next moment he was doubled up by a violent coughing fit, which nearly always attack, attacked him soon after waking up. It emptied his lungs so completely that he could only begin breathing again by lying on his back and taking a series of deep gasps. His veins had swelled with the effort of the cough, and the varicose ulcer had started itching. Just a second, guys. I need to take a drink of water. My voice and my, my tongue and my throat are quite dry. I apologize. Thirty to forty group, yapped a piercing female voice. Thirty to forty group, take your places, please. Thirty to four, thirties to forties. Winston sprang to attention in front of the telescreen, upon which the image of a youngish woman, scrawny but muscular, dressed in tunic and gym shoes, had already appeared. Arms bending and stretching, she rapped out. Take your time, by me. One, two, three, four. Two, one, two, three, four. Come on, comrades. Put a bit of life into it. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. The pain of the coughing fit had not quite driven out of Winston's mind the impression made by this his dream, and the rhythmic mov movements of the exercise restored it somewhat. As he mechanically shot his arms back and forth, wearing on his face the look of, a gr of grim enjoyment, which was considered proper during the physical jerks, he was struggling to think his way backward into the dim period of his early childhood. It was extraordinarily difficult. Beyond the late fifties, everything faded. When there were no external records that you could refer to, even the outline of your own life lost its sharpness. You remembered huge events which had quite probably not happened. You remembered the details of incidents without being able to recapture their atmosphere, and there were long blank periods to which you could assign nothing. Everything had been different then. Even the names of countries and their shapes on the map had been different. Airstrip 1, for instance, had, been, had not been so called in those days. It had been called England or Britain, though London, he felt fairly certain, had always been called London. Winston could not definitely remember a time when his country had not been at war, but it was evident that there had been a fairly long interval of peace during his childhood because one of his early memories was of an air raid which appeared to take everyone by surprise. Perhaps it was the time when the atomic bomb had fallen on Colchester. He did not remember the raid itself, but he did remember his father's hand clutching his own as they hurried down, down, down into some place deep into the earth round and round a spiral staircase which rang under his feet, feet and which finally so, uh, so wearied his legs that he began whimpering and they had to stop and rest. His mother, in her slow, dreamy way, was following a long way behind them. She was carrying his baby sister, or perhaps it was only a bundle of blankets that she was carrying. He was not certain whether his sister had been born then. Finally, they had emerged into a noisy, crowded place, which he had realized to be a tube station. Of course, the tubes in, in London are the, the uh, subway. There were people sitting all over the stone-flagged floor, and other people, packed tightly together, were sitting on metal bunks, one above the other. Winston and his mother and father found themselves a place on the floor and near them an old man and an old woman were sitting side by side on a bunk the old man had on a decent dark suit and a black cloth cap pushed back from every white hair from very sorry from very white hair his face was scarlet and his eyes were blue and full of tears he reeked of gin it seemed to breathe out of his skin in pale in, in place of sweat and once once he could have and one he could have fancied that and sorry and one he could have fancied that the tears welling from his eyes were pure gin one could have fancied 
Sorry, I really screwed that sentence up. I apologize. But though slightly drunk, he was also suffering under some grief that was genuine and unbearable. In his childish way, Winston grasped that some terrible thing, something that was beyond forgiveness and could never be remedied, had just happened. It also seemed to him that he knew what it was. Someone whom the old man loved, a little granddaughter perhaps, had been killed. Every few minutes the old man kept repeating, why didn't ought to have trust we didn't ought to have trusted him i said so ma didn't i that's what it come of trusting him i said so all along we didn't tr uh, ought to have trusted the buggers but which bug buggers they didn't ought to have trusted winston could not now remember since about that time war had been literally continuous though strictly speaking it had not always been the same war for several months during his childhood, there had been confused street fighting in London itself, some of which he remembered vividly. But to trace out the history of the whole period, to say who was fighting whom at any given moment, would have been utterly impossible, since no written record and no spoken word ever made mention of any other alignment than the existing one. Again, here, uh, the, you know, the, the erasure of language, you know, the erasure of written records. At this point, for example, in 1984, if it was 1984, Oceania was at war with Eurasia and in alliance with, with East Asia. In no public or private utterance was it ever admitted that the three powers had at any time been grouped along different lines. Actually, as Winston well knew, it was only four years since Oceania had been at war with East Asia and in alliance with Eurasia, but that was merely a piece of furtive knowledge which he happened to possess because his memory was not satisfactorily under control. Officially, the change of partners had never happened. Oceania was at war with Eurasia. Therefore, Oceania had always been at war with Eurasia. The enemy of the moment always represented absolute evil, and it followed that any past or future agreement with him was impossible. The frightening thing, he reflected for the ten thousandth time as he forced his shoulders painfully backward, with hands on hips, they were gyrating their bodies from the waist, an exercise that was supposed to be good for the back muscles. The frightening thing was that it might all be true. If the party could thrust its hand into the past and say of this or that event, it never happened, that surely was more terrifying than mere torture or death. The party said that Oceania, Oceania had never been in alliance with Eurasia. He, Winston Smith, knew that Oceania had been in alliance with Eurasia as short as a time as four years ago. But where did that knowledge exist? Only in his own consciousness, which in any case must soon be annihilated. And if all others accepted the lie which the party imposed, if all records told the same tale, then the lie passed into history and became truth. Who controls the past? ran the party slogan controls the future. Who controls the present controls the past. And yet the past, though of its nature unalterable, uh, sorry, sorry, though of its nature alterable, never had been altered. Whatever was true now was true from everlasting to everlasting. It was quite simple. All that was needed was an unending series of victories over your own memory. Reality control, they called it in Newspeak. Double think. Stand easy, barked the inst instructress a little more genially. Winston sank his arms to his sides and slowly refilled his lungs with air. His mind slid away into the labyrinthine world of doublethink. To know and not to know, to be conscious of complete truth truthfulness while telling carefully constructed lies, to hold simultaneously two opinions which cancelled out, knowing them to be contradictory and believing in both of them, to use logic against logic, to repudiate morality while laying claim to it, to believe that democracy was impossible and that the party was the guardian of democracy, to forget whatever it was necessary to forget, then to draw it back into memory again at the moment when it was needed, and then promptly to forget it again, and above all, to apply the same process to the process itself. That was the ultimate subtlety consciously to induce unconsciousness and then 
once again to become unconscious of the act of hypnosis you had just performed. Even to understand the word doublethink involved the use of doublethink. Um, just as a kind of a side note, doublethink, this description of doublethink and being able to hold two ideas in your head, contradictory ideas at the same time, uh, we call it now um, cognitive dissonance. So our ability to believe one thing and know the opposite basically is, is what's talked about. So cognitive dissonance is, is what we're uh, talking about, and I need to write that down. Uh, hopefully I'm going to remember to write that down. All right. The instructress had called them to attention again, and now let's see which of us can touch our toes, she said enthusiastically. Right over, uh, right over from the hips, please, comrades. One, two, one, two. Winston loathed this exercise, which sent shooting pains all the way from his heels to his buttocks and often ended by bringing on another coughing fit. The, the half, uh, sorry, the half pleasant quality went out of his meditations. The past, he reflected, had not merely been altered, it had been actually destroyed. For how could you establish even the most obvious fact when there existed no record outside your own memory? He tried to remember in what year he had first heard mention of Big Brother. He thought it must have been at some time in the 60s, but it was impossible to be certain. In the party histories, of course, Big Brother, fig uh, Big Brother figure is the figured as the leader and guardian of the revolution since its very earliest days. His exploits had been gradually pushed backwards in time until already they extended into the fabulous world of the 40s and the 30s, when the capitalists in their strange cylindrical hats still rode through the streets of London in great gleaming motor cars or horse carriages with glass sides. There was, there was no knowledge, uh, sorry, there was no knowing how much of this legend was true and how much invented. Winston could not even remember at what date the party itself had come into existence. He did not believe he had ever heard the word Ingsoc before 1960, but it was possible that in its old speak form, English socialism, that is to say, it had been current earlier. Everything melted into mist. Sometimes, indeed, you could put your finger on a definite lie. It was not true, for example, as, we, as was claimed in the party history books, that the party had invented airplanes. He remembered airplanes since his earliest childhood, but you could prove nothing. There was never any evidence. Just once in his whole life, he had held in his hands unmistakable documentary proof of the falsification of a historical fact. And on that occasion, Smith, screamed the shrewish voice from the television, 6079 Smith W. Yes, you. Bend lower, please. You can do better than that. You're not trying. Lower, please. That's better, comrade. Now stand at ease, the whole squad, and watch me. A sudden hot sweat had broken out all over Winston's body. His face remained completely inscrutable. Never show dismay, never show resentment. A single flicker of the eyes could give you away. He stood watching while the instructress raised her arms above her head, and one could not say gracefully, but with remarkable neatness and efficiency, bent over and tucked the first joint of her fingers under her toes. There, comrades, that's how I want to see you doing it. Watch me again. I'm 39 and I've had four children. Now look, she bent over again. You see my knees aren't bent. You can, you can all do it if you want to, she added as she straightened herself up. Anyone under 45 is perfectly capable of touching his toes. We don't all have the privilege of fighting in the front line, but at least we can all keep fit. Remember our boys on the Malabar front and the sailors in the floating fortresses. Just think what they have to put up with. Now try again. That's better, comrade. That's much better, she added encouragingly as Winston, with a violent lunge, succeeded in touching his toes with knees unbent for the first time in several years. We'll stop there. I think there's lots of things that have come up for me, at least in my mind. I'm trying to hold them in my brain long enough to get them written down here. Um, but as we wrap up here, 
Um, let's return to the questions. Noticing the uses of language in this novel, what connections do you see between these observations and previous ideas in class? Again, kind of what I've said um, about um, propaganda, but I'm also noticing this, this version of lying and the erasure of the past, and I think probably there are connections to be drawn there between the speeches that you guys did a couple of weeks ago and uses of language and being responsible with language, so I think um, definitely, definitely connections to the previous unit. Um, ideas in this novel, um, including use of language, but also other things that are happening today, um, you know, I think lots of things, again, my mind goes back to, to social media and, and monitoring, but also um, just, you know, the fact that we're living in a time where the government has um, definitely taken some some actions to control people's lives. Um, you know, um, you know, the, think about this, the line that we hear of flattening the curve and and compare it to the slogans of of um, of you know, the party in the book. So um, it's just a connection. I'm not trying to pass judgment here, but, you know, just a connection to, to keep in mind. And then finally, um, you know, the, this use, the, the fiction and the, the use of different voices and, you know, different ideas is something that I'm noticing. I, I'm also noticing um, tons of uh, positives, if you guys aren't noticing those, you know, those, those you know, dashes and parentheses and commas and um, just, you know, the ability to insert ideas and add a bit of um, individuality to, to this. And, and uh, so, yeah, just just different ideas to, to think over. Um, and remember, cognitive dissonance, cognitive dissonance. I'm going to write that down as soon as, as soon as I'm done here. So we have um, one more reading to do on Monday before we get to a discussion board that will be on Canvas on Tuesday. And I'm excited to kind of see what you guys bring up and talk about on Tuesday. And um, yeah, um, I'll see you next time. Have, have an excellent rest of your day and stay safe, stay healthy, stay sane. Um, let me know how you're doing if you feel like it. Talk to you later.